thank you very much. I'm grateful for the senator from Georgia uh, for a few moments to speak on the floor this evening. We have a quorum call. Oh, forgive me. Um, I'd like to uh, note the absence of the quorum. Without objection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I've watched uh, uh, this body has recently really begun to work in a bipartisan fashion, uh, trying to stabilize the insurance markets under the Affordable Care Act. In fact, under the leadership of Senator Murray, the ranking member of the Health Committee, and Senator Alexander, the chairman of the Health Committee, there's been efforts going on. There's actually been a number of hearings held on what needs to be done to stabilize the Affordable Care Act and strengthen the Affordable Care Act. This is coming about because of a crisis. While in January of this year, uh, leading from December, uh, we even had people like Standard & Poor's talking about how stable these exchanges were, we've seen over the last months many actions that have taken place threatening cost sharing, not advertising in the markets, many actions taken by the Trump administration that has weakened the markets and put the markets in crisis. But it's actually not the markets that are in crisis. It's fellow Americans, people who want the same thing, whether they're Republican or Democrat, from the West or East or North or South or in the heart of our country, they want the same thing. They want affordable care that's quality and that is accessible. We've come a long way to where we are right now. Under the Affordable Care Act, we have increased the number of Americans who have health insurance by over 20 million. We've been actually able to bend the cost curve. Actually, the Affordable Care Act has taken us out of days that no American, very few want us to go back to, the days where people could deny you coverage based on a pre-existing condition. The Affordable Care Act created an essential set of benefits that again, Americans from both sides of the aisle think it's really important. These essential benefits include things like women healthcare for women having children. That's included things like putting a parity between mental health care and what might be called physical health care. There's been so many improvements in the Affordable Care Act, and I've heard about them from constituents all over my state, as well as hearing the voices from all around the United States of America. Difficult stories about people who had lifetime caps, who because they had a, their child had an illness as a child, by the time that child was an adult, they couldn't find insurance. Or people who were being denied insurance because of a pre-existing condition, people who were declaring bankruptcy in this country at rates significantly higher than we're seeing now because they could not afford their health insurance. In fact, personal bankruptcy in our nation has been cut around 50%. These were all the gains we've achieved through the Affordable Care Act, the expansion of health care to millions of more, the security of knowing that your health insurance won't be cut off because of a pre-existing condition, the knowing that when you're paying for health coverage, it's gonna carry essential benefits that every American should get. These gains and many more. And what's happened after the failure of Trump care, after the failure of Republican plans, what actually came out of that were something that was encouraging to me as a se senator that's been here for three plus years to see some of the state's people from our Senate, Lamar Alexander, Senator Murray, come together and say, hey, we have a crisis in our country. Some of these markets are losing stability. We should work together, put aside partisan differences, try to find a pathway forward to make sure that in some states, millions of folks don't lose health insurance. And you heard, at least I did, some of the best commentary in this body. Perhaps most notably a speech by John McCain who stood up and so strongly talked about regular order, talked about us doing things in the Senate in a way that brought us together, that invited in the public, that had a wide berth of people participating in the crafting of policy, policy that affects nearly 20% of our economy, policy that affects 
hundreds of millions of Americans policy that is critical to the success of our nation. And I'm grateful that Murray and Alexander have been holding bipartisan hearings to try to stabilize the market periods. Through this process over the past month, we've had bipartisan governors, governors from both parties, insurance commissioners, consumers, they've all had the opportunity to come in and begin to weigh in on different proposals and their impact on the health insurance marketplace. You see, this shows that we can work together to try to improve the Affordable Care Act. Not this idea that we throw, out, throw it out, hurting not just a few people, but literally tens of millions of Americans. This is the way it should be done. The past proposals that have failed in this body were done the wrong way. People crafting legislation behind closed doors in a non-inclusive manner, in a partisan manner, not holding hearings, not bringing experts in. That's not the way this body was meant to work. In fact, for those who criticize the Affordable Care Act, for the Affordable Care Act, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of bipartisan hearings. Over 100 amendments from the Republican Party were included in the ultimate legislation. It was a process that took months and months and months. The President of the United States even met with the Republican senators and congresspeople to discuss and debate the legislation, and it was aired on CNN, on C-SPAN. This showed the best of who we are, that when we come together as a body and go through a process, good legislation, not perfect legislation, but good legislation could advance us towards our principles. And those principles were principles that were discussed during the last presidential campaign by both candidates. Donald Trump himself, our president, said time and time again, I want us to have an insurance, a health system in which everyone is covered in which everyone has affordable and quality health care. These values are debatable. And I'm disappointed. I am frustrated. I am angry that we are here again while a bipartisan process is going on, and we're having, as a great New Jerseyan once said, Yogi Berra, we're having deja vu all over again. You see, here we are, now coming back this week, and we're hearing about another Republican bill that has not gone through regular order, that has not had hearings, that has not had a bipartisan process. Another bill is coming to the floor, that people are whipping up votes, that we might have yet another dramatic moment in this body in which millions of Americans are watching and holding their breath because their families, their children, their senior citizen parents are all being held in the balance about the decision that this body would make, not going through regular order, not bringing input from experts on legislation that hasn't even been scored by the Congressional Budget Office. The CBO hasn't scored this bill. We don't know what its total impact would be on health coverage, on costs. We don't know how many people could lose their coverage exactly, how much premiums could skyrocket for the middle class, and just how much and how Medicaid would ultimately be gutted. This is the bill that's coming before us. This is the threat right now to our nation, and to millions of people. But we do know enough about this bill and that previous versions of their repeal plan that look very similar to this, to this bill give us many hints, more than hints, give us much evidence about what this bill would do and how this bill would again cause millions to lose their coverage have premiums again skyrocket. And for those that rely on Medicaid, for everything from opioid addiction treatment to maternity care, the millions that, or that, re that rely on Medicaid, they would suffer. Let me go through some things that we know about this legislation that is being threatened to bring, brought to the Senate floor, that, that, that now 
casts a shadow over the coverage earned and gained by millions of Americans. This legislation would still take coverage away from millions of Americans. We know that this destructive version, this partisan repeal plan, will take coverage away from millions of people. Experts have projected that already, that after 10 years, this partisan repeal plan could cause over 30 million Americans to lose their coverage. 30 million Americans cast back into a world where one illness, one injury could devastate their families, could send them into bankruptcy. That one illness, that one injury could have the worst of results, could cast us back to a time when so many Americans were using emergency rooms and emergency room doctors as their primary care physicians, cast us back into a time when many Americans were delaying seeing doctors because they couldn't afford to, allowing preventable diseases or treatable diseases to get worse and worse. 30 million Americans losing their health insurance means more Americans will die. That's not a dramatic hyperbolic statement. That is the truth. When health coverage rates go down, American mortality rates go up. What else do we know about this legislation? Is that it still raises costs like the other versions of Trump care. This version of this partisan repeal plan will still force hardworking Americans to pay more for actually worse care. It would abruptly end the critical assistance subsidies that have allowed millions to afford care. It would end support for people in the very marketplaces that two other bipartisan senators through the Health Committee are trying to talk, discuss now how we're going to stabilize those markets to give people that very access. And we know that as a result of this repeal plan, Americans can see their deductibles increase by several thousand dollars. And we could once again, once again, with those increases, see bankruptcy rates increase after dropping dramatically under the Affordable Care Act. What else do we know about this legislation, this newest version of Trump care? Well, it still ends federal protections like the other plans did, protections for people with pre-existing conditions. This version of this repeal plan, Trump Care's latest version, would still enable insurance companies to charge folks who are sick or who have been ill, or who have a pre-existing condition, they would be able to charge them for more care. States could waive that restriction on discrimination against people with pre-existing conditions. This plan will still subject millions of Americans with those pre-existing conditions to price discrimination, meaning Americans who had, may have had cancer, Americans who, may, who are pregnant, Americans with a child with autism could be forced to pay thousands and thousands of dollars more just to get coverage. What else does this newest piece of legislation, this attempt at Trump care again, what else does it do? Well, it ends the Medicaid expansion and it establishes a per capita cap and reduction of Medicaid by ending Medicaid as we know it, after over 50 years of this program, by suddenly capping it and ultimately giving block grants to states, we know that it will affect dramatically the people that this program and these expansions have covered. And who gets covered by Medicaid? Who will be affected? Well, in America right now, over half of all low-income families rely on Medicaid. Two out of three of our seniors living in nursing homes rely on Medicaid. Half, half of all the births in the United States of America are children, our future, our greatest natural resource, half are covered by Medicaid. Here is our reality. We are gutting a program that benefits us all, our seniors, 
our children, as well as the disabled. The cruel Medicaid cuts proposed in this bill, the cuts and the caps in this version, will still put those who have the most to lose in the most serious jeopardy, those seniors in nursing homes, working families, communities of color, women, Americans with disabilities, those folks who are struggling already with illness, elder Americans, Americans living in rural areas, Americans living in our cities. This is not who we are. This is not our values. This kind of draconian action is unacceptable in a nation this great. What else does it do? This newest version of Trump care, what else does it do? Well, this bill, in this version, just like ones before, still erodes critical patient protections, critical patient protections established by the Affordable Care Act. By allowing states to apply for a waiver to opt out of the ACA's essential benefits requirement for things as basic as maternity care, substance abuse services, prescription drugs, emergency services, hospitalizations, and rehabilitation services. This repeal plan could essentially give insurers the green light to once again charge for junk insurance plans that don't actually cover needed care. You may have health insurance, but it may be so limited and so constricted that when you actually get sick, you find out it does not cover your illness, your health challenge, your injury. This newest version of Trump care, this newest version of a partisan repeal plan, it also still threatens women's health. Women comprise, two, comprise two-thirds of all adult enrollees in Medicaid, and they would be essentially hurt by the gutting of that program. And this repeal plan, like previous versions, would still cut off low-income women from accessing critical preventative and healthcare services from Planned Parenthood, health centers that provide essential preventative care, and often, in many counties, the only avenue to contraceptive services. It singles out Planned Parenthood by not allowing them to be reimbursed for basic health services, making it so much more difficult for women all around our country to access important care. What else does this most recent version of Trump care, this partisan bill not going through regular order? Well, just like the other ones, it would still weaken the federal prohibition on lifetime limits, lifetime caps on the insurance that one can receive. That means that Americans with chronic diseases and conditions and children with unique medical needs and challenges who still need continued life-saving care could be forced, once they hit that cap, to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on continued care, even though they were insured, thus devastating families, sending them into bankruptcy, spiraling them to financial catastrophe. A couple of months back, one of my constituents tweeted me a photo of her son's medical bill after a recent surgery. The bill was for $500. But it showed that without the coverage she got because of the Affordable Care Act, she would have owed over $230,000. That was just for her child's heart surgery. And her son, Ethan, who was born with a rare genetic disorder, has had four of those surgeries. Under this partisan plan, not only could essential health benefits like hospitalizations and prescription drugs be denied Ethan, but lifetime caps on coverage would disqualify Ethan from accessing the care he needs. As Ethan's mom put it to me, the lifetime cap is the equivalent of just saying, sorry, you're not worth keeping alive anymore. You're just too expensive. 
And that's what this plan would allow insurance companies to do. Essentially saying to Americans that if you had a problem when you were a child, if you had surgeries as a child, once you hit that cap, you're not worth covering anymore. We had a vote on the floor today. It was for national defense. It was a major bill. There were strong statements and speeches on both sides of the aisle. But at the end of the day, the overwhelming majority of us joined together with great expense to provide for our nation's national defense. That is to provide for our defense department. It is this common ideal in this body that this government formed by our forefathers and mothers. The Constitution upon which we stand proclaims that we are forming this government for the common good, for the common defense. But as we've seen in recent days, the idea of defense isn't just protecting us against the threat of North Korea, isn't just protecting us from the efforts of the Russians, it's not just protecting us from terrorist organizations, we've seen that the national defense also means the challenges of natural disaster. It was profound for all of us to see the crisis faced from Texas to Florida and how we as a nation, hero after hero, in communities large and small, stood up in this time and were there for their fellow American, never asking their party, never asking or questioning what different religion they might have, people from all different ethnicities banded together because that is what Americans do. When we're threatened, when we're attacked, whether it's a national, natural disaster or an enemy from far, we stand up and take care of each other. The very formation and foundation of our government is based on these ideals that we're stronger together when we stand together, when we fight together, when we invest in each other and sacrifice for each other. I'm one that believes that our defense of this nation isn't just a powerful military abroad and at home, the defense of our nation also means for a vulnerable child that has a terrible disease that we can cure. We are a nation that should take care of our own. The defense of our country means that our elder citizens, two-thirds of whom in nursing homes rely on the Medicaid program that the defense of our nation, the preservation of our ideals, is evidenced in the care of those elderly, the dignity that we acknowledge and afford them. That is the very definition of who we are as Americans. I'm one of those people that believes the ideals of this nation are evident not just in the strength of our military, but also in the strength of our system of health care. And that it is a violation of our principles and values as a nation. When our health care system breaks down to not the ideals we see in our military, where we protect all of our country, when we stand for everyone, rich or poor, but suddenly with our health care system, with accessing life-saving medicines and procedures, critical preventative care, that that suddenly boils down to who is very wealthy, gets access, and people who are struggling in minimum wage jobs, fighting every day to raise their kids, that somehow that should not be covered in our ideals. We are a nation that professes the most profound values the oldest constitutional democracy that put forth ideals that we are not a theocracy, a nation based upon privilege, based upon how you pray, that we are not a monarchy, that we are the oldest constitutional democracy that put ideals forward that became lights to other nations. This ideal that we believe in liberty and justice for all. What justice is there in a piece of legislation 
that would cast millions of Americans, our poorest Americans, our sickest Americans, our elderly Americans, into a world where they no longer have the security of health care. Is that justice in this country? What is the conception of liberty in our nation if some people are shackled to fear and worry that if their child gets sick, they will not have access to care? What is freedom if people are imprisoned by an illness and disease that they cannot get adequately treated because they do not have health coverage? Essential to the ideals of our country, the ideals of life and liberty and happiness is having a system of health care that provides a stable foundation for life. When half of the children born in this country are beneficiaries of a Medicaid program, why would we slash that program that undermines the very start of the life of our children? That is against our values as a country. We are a nation that every generation has expanded access, has expanded opportunity. Over 50 years ago, when Medicare and Medicaid programs that were formed, expanding access to health care for the elderly, expanding access to health care for the sick, expanding access to health care for hardworking, low-income people, that was an advancement forward. When this body passed the Affordable Care Act and 20 million more Americans gained access to health care, to life-saving procedures, for, to the stability that comes from having that security, we advanced this nation more towards its ideals. This body should be coming together to take the imperfections of the Affordable Care Act, to, to find where it's fallen short and to working together to build upon that foundation so that everyone in this nation can have justice and opportunity, that everyone, when it comes to the grip of illness or disease, can find the freedom that comes, the security, the ease of mind to knowing that they can afford to go to a doctor. That's a national aspiration, that is national defense, that is who we are and what we stand for. And so now here we are again. The most frustrating moments of my time as a United States Senator to have seen legislation not in any way coming through the processes set up by our forefathers and mothers in this place, the traditions of the Senate, to usurp them all, to rush to the floor, to vote on legislation that hasn't benefited from the wisdom and the genius and the experience of medical professionals, of experts, but just was pushed to the floor that even nonpartisan experts would say would rip healthcare for millions, would raise costs for elderly. How, how can we as a body do this to ourselves? We're in this situation again, where legislation is being proposed, where votes are being counted, where people are discussing, hey, can we bring a bill to the floor, another version of those that have fallen and been defeated, can we bring this version forward? And I just say, it's time we stop. It's time we understand that in the same way we hammered out a bill today, and passed legislation, billions and billions of dollars to protect our country from threats abroad, that we take the same kind of effort to work together, to talk, to hold hearings, to listen to each other, to try to make sure that we are defending each other, 
supporting each other, helping each other, that we are a generation that, like our forefathers and mothers, is expanding conceptions of liberty and freedom and access for more people. And yet instead, here we are, with millions of Americans now turning their attention back to the United States Senate. Americans with disabilities. Parents with children like Ethan, who worry that should they need another operation, if the rules change, if the legislation changes, they won't have that access. Young people with parents in nursing homes wondering, will Medicaid expansion survive? Yet another attempt to gut the program. At a time, we need to be encouraging each other, strengthening our commitments to one another. We face a time of jeopardy, a decision point, a crossroads, not just in the pragmatic realities of healthcare that will come forward, but a crossroads of our values, a crossroads of our ideals. Will we go forward as a nation together, expanding opportunity, securing justice, defending each other, empowering each other, or will we go back? I end with saying this. What I've learned is that the decisions made here are not always easy, and that they are often dependent upon the engagement of the nation as a whole. I stand here, the beneficiary of courageous Americans who stood and fought for all of our values, all of our ideals, to expand access and equality and opportunity, to fight to defend this nation at home and abroad, to insist that every child have certain basic rights and opportunities. This is yet another moral moment for our nation. I believe that every child should have access to affordable, quality health care. I believe that every senior citizen growing old should have the security and the dignity of healthy environments. I believe that people should not be denied the justice of health care because they have a pre-existing condition. I don't think these are radical beliefs in any way that I think it was radical to stand up in the late 1800s and say women should have the right to vote, that it was radical to think that children should not have to experience child labor. It wasn't radical to say that black Americans should have equal access to restaurants and hotels. It's, these weren't radical ideas. But the reason why this body stood up in generation after generation, securing privileges and expanding opportunity and opening up access the reason why this body did that was not just because of the decisions of the people on this floor, it was because Americans stood up and demanded these changes, demanded this progress, fought for every inch of ground, and that is the moment we're in right now. A call to the conscience of our country. I ask everyone, this is not a time to be silent, this is not a time to be indifferent. This is not a time for apathy. This is a time for all of us to make a decision about who will we be as a nation. Will we be a nation that provides affordable, quality health care to all, or will we will slide back into that basic right being only available to a smaller and smaller group of people? That is the decision. And the decision will be made not just by the votes on this floor, or the decisions made by the hundred of them in this body, it must be made collectively through our engagement and through our activism and what we demand from our, our representatives. So here we are in this moral moment, with this decision before our country. And my prayer and my hope is that all of us with a collective voice, with a chorus that resonates with that of our ancestors, that we fight for the defense of our nation, that we stand up and take responsibility for ideals of equal justice, ideals of liberty and freedom, ideals of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, ideals to 
that have made this nation shine, that have shown our greatness and our character, that doesn't happen by accident or some inevitability of history. It happens because we fight for it and work for it. And if there's any moment in American history where we need that spirit, that American grit, that toughness in that fight, it is this moment right now. Mr. President, thank you. I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll.